The following episode of the Maui Chamber of Commerce's Business Matters was originally broadcast on May 9th, 2023. It's time now for Business Matters, brought to you by Mokulele Airlines, with your host, Pam Tumpop. Good morning, Pam. Hey, good morning, Gary. How are you this beautiful Uh, day? Very good. Oh, glad to hear it. Well, welcome, everybody, to Business Matters. I'm Pamela Tumpop, president of the Maui Chamber of Commerce, and today we are going to talk with Representative Troy Hashimoto about the legislative session. We're going to get an update on housing projects and more from Habitat for Humanity, and we're going to learn about a chamber member called Combined Insurance, one of our recent new members. But let's start off by, first I'd like to welcome Representative Troy Hashimoto, born and raised on Maui, deeply rooted in the community as a fifth generation Maui boy. Uh, His parents have the phenomenal persimmon farm. He was appointed by Governor Ige in 2018 to fill a vacant seat and has been re-elected to that uh, House District 10 since. So we're thrilled to have Troy with us to share uh, the work that he's been doing this session and give us some of the amazing highlights this year. So good morning, Troy. How are you this morning? Good morning, Tam. Uh, Great to to hear from you, and I'm I'm glad to be on the show this morning. Well, thank you so much. I know it's been a busy session, and you have been sharing such an important committee to us, uh, the Housing Committee, which, you know, there were a lot of bills because... At the beginning of the session, everybody says, housing, housing, housing. We're in a crisis state. We need to really address this. And really looking at ways to expedite, um, you know, whether we call it affordable or we we talk about what's attainable. Um, can you share some of the, the bills that went through this year and some of the things that we can be excited about in moving housing forward? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it was my first time being a chair in the state house. I think I've served as the vice chair um, of the housing committee and um, for the, the last term. And so it was very eye-opening experience to understand and shepherd a lot of bills through the process. And I think we've done a, a really good job um, in, in trying to position housing and the housing pipeline for the next couple of years. And I, I think, you know, the biggest accomplishments, although we passed some really good bills, um, and some experimental bills to, to see housing move forward, I think the biggest accomplishments this year was making sure that we were able to invest, continually invest in the housing pipeline. So I think one of the biggest things that we, we continue to do is, and this is the, the biggest driver of housing development throughout the state, is we made a, a $280 million investment into the Rental Housing Trust Fund. And so this is supposed to help uh, pair housing projects up with low-income housing tax credits. Uh, And so that's a federal program where developers are able to get some federal credits, match it with the state infusion, and that's how they're supposed to be able to build housing that 60% of the area median income and below. And so that really is the core of where we're missing a lot of different housing and so I think that is a really important um, infusion into that trust fund uh, to get some building um, to happen. We also we also have another fund called the Dwelling Unit Revolving Fund, and over the biennium, we're, we're investing another hundred million dollars into that fund, and that's to help projects with various infrastructure needs. Um, it's it's also to to do loans for various projects that are that have some gaps in their construction, uh, and so I think those are, are two really critical investments. One of the biggest things we also were, was able to get to the finish line this year is that Maui County has always declined a general excise uh, tax increase. Right. So every other island has a half percent, for it's primarily transportation, uh, but I think we, the thinking was is Maui really needs help in the housing arena. And so we are giving Maui the ability to enact, if they choose to do so, this is the county council and the mayor will have to make this decision if they would like to enact a half percent, up to a half percent general excise tax surcharge. And if they do, the the only thing that they would be able to to use it for is 
housing infrastructure. So that is all the pipes, the roads, um, the, the, you know, all the ancillary type of infrastructure needed to build an affordable housing project. And why that's important is because a lot of times, in my opinion, why housing, the cost of housing has gone up so much is because private developers have had to take on all these infrastructure costs. And what they do is they don't, they don't eat that cost. They pass it on to the user, the people who are buying the house. And so, you know, if government just did what they were supposed to do by taking care of the sewer water, um, you know, all the things that, you know, really a county government should take care of, that will bring down the, the cost of housing just, uh, you know, a, a good chunk. And it, w- it will also bring down the risk that developers are taking. So I think this is a potentially a very interesting new source of funding that the county will have access to. And again, we'll see if they want to take advantage of it. We, I think they've had a, two other opportunities and they said no, but this is one last chance that they'll probably have uh, because that the, the surcharge statewide does sunset in 2030. So some very interesting bills moving this year. It really, this was a, this was a fascinating session. Um, I know you and I have talked before. We, we've been thrilled with all the updates you've provided us throughout the session on, you know, where things are going in housing and, and saw a great alignment at the beginning of the session. Um, so, you know, we're, we're excited to see this. We're excited to see um, new ways also to, to um, address homelessness as well. And, you know, moving forward with uh, expediting things for critical needs. And I love this in, uh, this issue on infrastructure. We'll see what happens. I guess we'll know in the budget session <laughs> on, on uh, what, whether they're going to take advantage of that. We'll see what happens with that. But um, definitely, as you point out, the when the developers have to incorporate the costs of the infrastructure, and there's been some key projects that for years people have criticized and said uh, in the Wailuku area, well, you know, why didn't this get done? And it was the infrastructure cost that was later put on to the developer that just never made it pencil out. So, you, it, and, but forever and a day people would look at the reports and say, we're due X, Y, Z units. Well, we weren't because it never penciled out. So this is another way to help. So I've, I'm thrilled that we've got, again, another tool in the toolbox and we'll see what happens with that. You know, there were many big wins this legislative session uh, for the Maui community. Can you share some of those with us? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the biggest things that the Maui delegation continues to focus on is that we want to make sure that our hospital is taken care of. And, you know, I I think one of the things that people think is because we went to a private model the state has kind of stepped away, but that's untrue. You know, we're, we're kind of in a test phase. It's a private-public partnership that Maui Health is running, and that still takes some type of public subsidy. And so I think in discussions with them, a, a lot of it, their, their concerns have been around cost. You know, costs have been going up in our daily lives. We've been seeing costs increase, and I think the hospital is no different. And so I think part of their situation is, you know, they had that strike with all of their UPW employees. They right. have also had to have, bring in traveling nurses to, to fill the shortage that they've had. And so, you know, over time, the, what the agreement was when we decided to go to a public-private model was the state subsidy for the hospital was supposed to decrease over time. Um, well, they got down to, I believe, $11 million last year. And unfortunately, with all these external factors, They've had to get. Uh, they requested a subsidy of 22 million this year, and I think we we had some very long internal discussions if we should fund the hospital at that level. And I think we decided we just have to do it because there was just so much unknown. So we gave them a 22 million dollar operating subsidy, so that will hopefully take care of all the needs that the hospital has for for from the operating aspects. We also gave them quite a bit in a capital improvement of projects over the course of two years, and that adds up to about almost $40 million over the biennium of our two-year budget. And you have to remember, that's important because 
the hospital still belongs to the state. And so we need yes. to continually invest um, into that hospital, the physical plant, because if any the private provider does pull out and we're looking for a new private provider or we can't find one, it does revert back to the state. So that is a huge um, you know, investment that we need to continue making to ensure that we have a strong healthcare system here on Maui. Some other big highlights is, uh, you know, right in Kahului, we're going to see uh, where the old MEO location is located. We're going to start to put out an RFP for a new, what we call a Kahului Civic Center. So we put $9 million in the budget to make that happen. That's going to be all affordable housing. It's going to continue what the, the Kahului Lani area has which is, is uh, another affordable development. So we're going to continue all of that. We also are going to um, we have a tremendous amount for our school, you know, at, at Baldwin High School, which is in my district. We're, we're trying to build them a new PE locker room because they have been using the county's facility for many, many years. And so we're going to move that facility onto campus. Um, we're also trying to air condition that school campus. And so we're well underway for... For, uh, with, with that project, we also purchased, um, or, or we have in the, the budget, funds to purchase Hagai Institute in South Maui, which is right across the street from Lokilani Intermediate, and this, uh, that, there's a pool out in Kihei, and that is supposed to be slated for housing as well, and so that's a partnership that we're hope, hoping to have with the county once we per- the state purchases it the property. We want to turn that over to the county and they can use that for affordable housing. And statewide, you did mention homelessness. I think one of the big things that we're trying to figure out is where is Maui going to put our Kauhale project? You know, the governor has um, announced that he wants to do all these Kauhale projects statewide, which is kind of temporary shelters, but it's essentially for, for to get homeless folks off the street into some type of shelter. You know, we had a test project on Waiale Road, and they've, they've kind of essentially uh, moved away from that, but we need to find a more of a, a, a permanent location. And so statewide, we have $15 million for that, along with Ohana Zone, uh, another $15 million. So Maui needs to take advantage of that so we get our fair share. I think the challenge continually has been with the Victorino administration and now the Bison administration, where exactly are those locations. But no shortage of funding, you know, for, for a lot of projects that are coming Maui's way. Yeah, and and that's the we've taken care of half the equation. <laughs> right, it's, exactly. it's been land and it's been funding, <laughs> and and we've got yeah. ideas and we've got ideas uh, and developers at all levels from from tiny homes to container homes and pull out container homes with restrooms included. Um, you know, but where's the land? And 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 again. Also, where's the infrastructure, right? So we, we it's the land, it's the infrastructure. Um, but the units, we can get solved. And so it's just getting those other two things aligned. But you're right, um, this has been a really a great session where so much investment and money has come to the county to really jettison us forward. And I was thinking back when you said air conditioning at Baldwin High School, and I was thinking, gosh, how I would have appreciated that. I won't say how many years ago, but uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I always thought, I always uh, loved looking out the window at the beach. It was really tragic <laughs> to think about uh, being on the beach when it was so warm out there. Uh, so wonderful for the students there. I think that that's uh, very much needed and well-deserved. You know, um, it was an, also an interesting session because, you know, there were there were some interesting movements this year on a number of bills, um, some bills that didn't pass. Uh, that we were, I mean, there was an interesting mooring bill that everybody was sort of shocked by, and then uh, the business community rallied and said, "Wait a minute, what the heck is this, and why are we doing that?" Um, and then a lot of things that got down to conference committee. What what would be some of the lessons that you think? were learned um, on some of the bills maybe that didn't pass or things that we might expect, um, maybe good things that didn't pass or or bad things that didn't pass, but what we learned in the lessons and what might we expect to come up again next year or should we prepare for it next year? Well, I think from 
from the bills that didn't pass, but I think there was, you know, when you take a look at the numbers, it, we actually passed about the same amount that we do every year. And I think when, when there are bills that you really want, sometimes it takes a couple of sessions. And I, I think I, I've learned that. And it, it's unpredictable sometimes and why, why or how a bill doesn't pass. And so you learn from it, you understand, you, you, you kind of get the input of, of who are, is against the bill, you, you understand who the allies are. And, of course, we'll try again next year, right? I think one of the bills right. that took us a couple years was a very simple bill to help the county um, to do maintenance within the SMA zone. And I think that took us a couple years to get, even though it was very straightforward. And the county obviously needs to fix telephone poles and sidewalks and, and whatnot. That's very simple. But I think what we, we should do is, we need to take this time during the interim, now that the session is over, to really focus on priorities and to continue the dialogue of what's really important to make sure that we're ready to go for the next session and to make sure the appropriate input is placed on all the bills that we want to get passed for the next session. And so I think if you have any ideas, if you have any thoughts that on bills that didn't make it or you think is really important, we need to know that now so we can start to, to figure out during this slow time, how do we make that happen um, when that next legislation, le legislative session comes around? Because there's so many important issues that we need to tackle to better our community, and we stand ready to, to work hand-in-hand hand with the community to make that happen. Well, and I appreciate that, Troy, and I know you're always open, so uh, we, we will take you up on that <laughs> invitation, I think, as you said. We don't have to wait till next session, because things fly fast when it comes to the session. That's so, right. you know, the Absolutely. planning should continue. Absolutely. Um, and with the session ending, what are the, what are, is there anything now that, you know, you talked about certain things, like, you know, the county is now going to have this opportunity to get up to a half a percent of GET to use for housing and, and uh, housing infrastructure. You know, um, where are some of the key things coming now, given what happened this session, that not just planning forward for next year, but some of the things that, you know, the community can really get involved in and take some immediate action on now? What are things that we can help with based on what occurred this session that um, where you see we can rally and move things quickly forward or continue to educate people on right away um, to, to ensure that the progress is made and that the work that was done to set us up, that the funds get achieved and used? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think in some respects, Getting and securing the funding is just half the battle. And sometimes it can be the easy, easy part because now the harder and more difficult part is the implementation, right? right? And I think a lot of times in state government, our constraint is that we have, we, we have the same personnel problems that every other entity has. And so we have um, a certain amount of people working to implement this, this large amount of priorities that the legislature sets out. And I think what we as a community need to do is if we know that there's money for a project, we need to keep pushing to make sure that it happens. So, so one good example is, you know, that we have this general excise tax increase uh, for affordable uh, infrastructure or affordable housing infrastructure. I think we have to make sure that the, the parties at play, which will be the county council and the mayor, understand the perspectives, both for and against, because I, I think, you know, whenever there's an increase in the taxes, there are p people that are going to be against, that they understand what the priorities are and how they're going to address that, and I think making sure that that gets done. The other thing is we know that there's a lot of money for homelessness, um, Kauhale projects, and I think a lot of times what the community, what the role of the community is to apply pressure, right, to make sure that right. those projects get done uh, and we actually take advantage of some of those funding because in the past, sometimes although we had opportunities to get funding, we, we've not taken advantage of the, the funding because we, we either that wasn't the priority at the time or we couldn't find locations or we, we didn't necessarily feel that um, it, it was needed. And so I think that that's the hard part is making sure that 
Um, we apply the pressure to make sure that the correct entities do the right thing to make things happen. And I think in a lot of cases, because we're on a neighbor island, the very, a strong partner to making a lot of this happen is the county, right? We're relying a lot on the county. It's very different on Oahu where we have a very big state presence um, with right. state employees, but on neighbor islands, you know, we have a less of a presence of state employees, so the county really sometimes is our partner to make some of these big projects happen. And so that's why I'm always talking to them, people within the county um, and to make sure that we can we can leverage and we can make projects happen. Well, I so appreciate the work that you continue to do. Um, just off the top of your head, and I don't I don't mean to put you on the spot because I'm just asking because I don't know it. For that Cal Holly uh, project, what is, do you know what the land area is that's required to do that project? So it will be up to essentially, uh, there's going to be two types of Cal Holly, right? One will be driven by the private sector. So if the private sector has some type of land available, um, they can offer it up and they can, they can then partner with the, the county and the state to to get the necessary funding, either through private or public sector, um, and then they have access to what is really important is the operations of the Kalhali, right? I think sometimes the build-out right. is the easiest part, but then to, to maintain it with security and the, the people that are, you know, to, to clean and to, to keep it um, moving, I, I think that's sometimes the hardest, but you'll get access to that type of funding um, if, if you are not deemed a Kalhali. The other part is the county also has the opportunity to lead a Kauhali. Um, and so there is no written criteria at this point. I think they're trying to figure some of the rules out. But I think it's the, the basic um, premise of it is, is that, you know, we, we want to find a, a large enough location uh, that I believe will house about 75 to 100 people. Um, okay. And that's kind of the minimum um, that they're looking at at this point. But every Kauhali to me will be very different. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think the goal is to just get folks um, off the streets into a location that has supportive services. Yes. And, and, and we can't underestimate the supportive services, as you point out. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> we know from the Pallet Project... Uh, you know, that a lot of supportive services are needed and, you know, a lot of folks that are on the street, um, you know, we won't take housing if they can't come with their pets or if they can't bring all bring their stuff. And, you know, it's it, and we need to get them to places where they can be safe and, as you mentioned, the security. So lots to do, but achievable because we have great community partners and um, we're very... It is. And, and I think the hardest part surprisingly, right, is you actually need running water. That, that's the key to a lot of these projects. You need mm -hmm. running water and you need some type of drainage of that water. And that is what hangs, you know, hold up for a lot of the build-out of these projects because without those two, the cost becomes very prohibitive because if you're trucking in water and you have to figure out how to, to uh, manage the, um, you know, the, the toilets, that it just continually to add up um, if you bring in porta potties, portable showers, um, portable toilets. It, 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 it doesn't really, it, we don't have enough money for that. So I think if we can have the physical infrastructure, that helps tremendously. But um, that's the hardest part in picking a location. And so that's why I always say we have to find that location that uh, we have some of that built in already. Well, I I am going to take heed to what you say, and and we're going to get on it <laughs> right away. We've been working on it in the background, but um, and we'll continue Absolutely. to do that. Yeah, it, yeah but uh, we'll, we'll, it's like you said, with land and infrastructure. So, I think we've got so many programs to help with the building now that it's phenomenal, and we've we've got a lot of tools in the tool shed. So it's time to pull them all out and start bringing people together again. Troy, mm -hmm. thank you for all your tremendous work. It's always great to have you on the show to give us an update, a progress updates, and end-of-year session updates. And let's continue the dialogue so that um, we're, we're continuing to plan forward for next session. Thank you, Pam, and for all your hard work. And we, we, I enjoy the partnership with the Chamber because I think, you know, when, when, when businesses are doing vibrant, our community is doing vibrant, and we're all connected. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Troy. I hope you have a wonderful day. 
Thank you. Take care. You too. Aloha. All right. We are going to next, speaking of housing, uh, one of our favorite topics for those who regularly listen to the show We're going to speak with Matthew Bachman. He is the Executive Director for Habitat for Humanity. And um, we're going to actually, I just realized that we're going to speak to Matthew right after we take a quick break to hear from our sponsor, um, Mokulele Airlines. Mokulele Airlines operates the largest commuter airline hub in the country, right here in Kahului. Fly Mokulele from Kahului to Molokai, Manai, Hana, Waimea, Kona, and now Hilo. Mokulele also operates the only flights between Kapalua and Honolulu. There is never a middle seat on Mokulele, and every seat has a window and aisle. Visit MokuleleAirlines.com and take your next flight from the newly renovated Mokulele Terminal. Let me just tell everybody real quick, so great to have you on. You have been with Habitat for Humanity now for three and a half years. And you are originally from Indiana, but you've uh, been on island for four years now, and you found, I understand, your forever home in Kihei. Oh, Matthew, are you there? I am. Hello. Good morning. Oh, uh, good morning. <laughs> so great to have you on the show. I just wanted to give everybody a little bit of an introduction since you've been with the agency for a while now, and we are so excited to hear about uh, Habitat for Humanity's current housing projects. Yeah, so um, Habitat for Humanity here on Maui, we've been around for 25 years. Uh, we're actually um, getting ready to celebrate our 25-year gala, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, we have, uh, what we do is we go, we, um, we help to build for those who are 80% of the average median income and below. Um, and so for a family of four, that's about um, $85,000 a year. Um, so, uh, you know, a good, a good set of, of the residents here um, can benefit. Um, over the past 25 years, we've been able to build um, almost uh, 70 homes here on Maui. Uh, we also work with the communities over on Molokai and Lanai. Um, and so uh, currently, um, we are working with the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, and uh, we have four new homes that are going to be started in the next uh, probably 45 days. Um, we just finished up a home up country uh, and had a house blessing in April. Um, so, yeah, we've got, got a lot of great things going on. Well, it's really exciting to know that you've, I mean, Habitat for Humanity has been doing this, as you said, for 25 years. Tell people a little bit about your structure, because I love the engagement and how you work with these new homeowners, but they, they too, get involved in the building of their home and, and uh, work with volunteers. Tell people a little bit about the process. Absolutely. So um, we have a model where in order to qualify for our housing, we just have three main things. Um, the first one is um, a, a need. And of course, <laughs> on Maui, you know, there, there's a lot of needs. So um, that that's pretty easy to come by. And we usually, uh, we look at that as if they're living in, if a family is in substandard housing or um, in housing that makes them um, what we call house burdened, burdened, excuse me, um, which means that they're paying more than 30% of their um, gross monthly income towards um, rent. Right. Uh, then the second thing we, we ask is we have to have a, a, an ability to repay. So we do give a 0% mortgage uh, to all of our homeowners, which uh, you can imagine saves quite a bit. Um, but there is, there is a 30-year 0% mortgage. And then the last thing we have is um, a, a willingness to partner. And this is kind of the, the model that you talked about a little bit, Pam, is that um, we require all of our homeowners um, with their uh, greater Ohana, with their friends and family, to do 500 hours of um, participation hours or what we kind of call sweat equity. Um, so they have, to, they have to do 500 hours of helping us build their home or build someone else's home. Part of the reason we're able to do so much of what we're able to do for um, Maui is that all of our homes are built with volunteer hours. Um, we only have uh, one or, I guess, two people on our construction team um, that helps to kind of lead the project, but it's the homeowners and their families and, and the greater community 
um, that helps to build it. We have groups that come out um, every year from Juneau, Alaska. We have uh, had a couple groups from um, the mainland last year um, that would come out. And then we also have um, a, a lot of great corporate sponsors um, on island that have their team come out on a weekend and to help build. And that's truly how um, we're raising, uh, you know, homes on, on this, on the island um, in a, a very cost-effective manner. Yeah, the work you do is really tremendous, and I love how you engage both the homeowners but also the broader community in building homes. I, I, I'm always hearing from people who say you know, how much fun they have participating in a Habitat for Humanity project because they know the gift that they help to give. And to to give help give a home is is such a tremendous gift. And people yeah, take great exactly. Pride in on the on the home that we just completed, um, it took about fifteen months, which you know is a little bit longer than probably what you think about for building a home. But we had almost a hundred volunteers and nearly two thousand hours that were wow. donated um, from the community uh, in order to get it done. Wow, that's really amazing. That's, I, I just applaud all that you do. Um, in addition to that, you folks are also really working hard to to just support housing in general on Maui. What are some of the other ways that Habitat gets involved? Yeah, so um, another one of our big projects right now, and it's, it's an ongoing program, I guess a project isn't the right word, a program. Um, it's called a brush with kindness. And basically what we are trying to do is to maintain the basically the stock of homes that we already have on Maui. So um, sometimes you drive around in, in some of the neighborhoods and you see some homes that, you know, could le- use a little TLC, you use, <laughs> use a little love. And so um, what we're here to do is to try and help to repair and renovate homes that um, have fallen a little bit under dis- into disrepair so that um, the people who live there can remain there. Um, right. One of the things that Maui County has been so um, so gracious, I guess, at is um, the Maui County Office on Aging has provided us with a grant um, for, for the past three years, and it looks like it's going to go through again uh, this coming year, that allows us to help our kapuna to age in place. And yeah. so um, for those homeowners that um, own their home are 60-plus, um, and make less than 80% of AMI, which most of, of our Kapuna do being on, on Social Security, um, we can go in and do all kinds of safety repairs um, to make sure that the Kapuna is safe in their home and that they can stay there um, safely. So we've done everything. Um, our, our favorite is what we call kind of a bathroom blowout. So we'll go into the bathroom and um, take out the tub and put in a shower um, put up a bunch of grab bars, put in an ADA appropriate a toilet. Um, we have gone um, and redone flooring so that there's not tripping hazards. Uh, we have put in um, new kitchens because their their kitchen is so falling apart that they're unable to kind of prepare food. Um, and we've done some uh, roof patches, especially <laughs> this past uh, rainy season was was pretty wild. So. Um, we've been able to do all that, and when we do that, it's at no cost um, to the homeowner. Um, it's all just uh, grant-based. Um, so we've been able to do that, and uh, we're fortunate enough, um, we're getting ready to ink the contract, as they say. Um, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands is also giving us uh, a very large grant to do um, 50 homes over the next six years to repair for um, all, of, all of our homesteaders. So uh, we want to just... Um, Sometimes there isn't enough, and we all know there's not always enough land or, or I guess, the, the ability to build brand-new housing, but we can take care of what we have already on the island. Absolutely, and truly important. And for everybody listening, you know, think about, <laughs> that's a really such a wonderful program, and how many of us have aging parents, um, you know, they, they're not able to upkeep the home the way it used to be upkept, Um we try and you know, jump in where we can, and but sometimes there's bigger things that they need. I, I love the bathroom blowout concept, and again, making getting rid of the tub, making uh, wheelchair accessible, giving them the grab bars, making sure they're safe, and the ADA toilets and things. There's so many things that 
you know, I, I find so many more of our seniors want to stay in their homes and, and uh, really want us to continue to live there, and, and they, they want it to be their forever home. So this is a great thing that you're doing, and I love that, again, that it's no cost to those who really need it. So we can all think about and, and talk to people about these programs and let them know what Habitat's doing to help our seniors continue to live where they want to be. Um, you know, you, you've got so many other things, and one of the things that we haven't yet talked about is your ReStore, but w- let's talk a little bit about your ReStore and other initiatives, uh, things that you're involved in in the community. Yeah, thank you. So um, uh, the ReStore is kind of like, uh, that is our, our forward-facing uh, meet the community type of place. Uh, for all of you who haven't been there, we moved um, a little bit uh, over the last three or four years. We're now at 1162 Lower Main Street uh, in a, a much bigger warehouse space. Uh, and unlike um, some, I guess, thrift stores, uh, we, um, we don't take clothes, uh, don't take a couple of other items, but uh, we're really fixed on the home. Um, it is a uh, kind of one of the slogans has been the store that uh, uh, the store that builds homes, um, and so uh, what we do is we take uh, donations of, of furniture, lamps, um, construction materials, tools, books, DVDs, um, doors, uh, anything that you can think of that when you're renovating your home that you that's been used but that is still in good condition. We we'll, we'll take those donations. Um, at the store, uh, we're open from 8:30 or yep, 8:30 to 4:30 uh, Monday through Saturday. Uh, and if you have donations, you can just call the store. But really, if you come on down, it's so much more than just uh, used items. Um, we've been able to partner with some of our uh, local businesses, with Lowe's, with Home Depot, with um, DeKine Paint. Um, with uh, Maui uh, doors and windows. And whenever they have, uh, TJ Maxx, <laughs> whenever they have uh, extra surplus of items, um, they bring them to us. And so, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, more times than not, you can walk into the store and find items that are, that have never been opened, that have never been used, that are, are, are brand new. And we discount all of it to 50% at least of market price. Um, and it is the, the funds that we raise from these donations that help to subsidize our, our home builds. Um, and so the, I, I kind of say that. So um, with our home build model, kind of going back to that just for a second, is that um, our homeowners, in order to keep it affordable, not only do we use um, volunteer hours, uh, we also give them what we call a silent second mortgage. So um, part of their mortgage, they're never going to have to pay, even though their home might be worth, you know, let's say $600,000 for a home that we built in Lahaina. They're never going to have to pay that whole amount because um, we're able to subsidize them um, on the on the backside through the donations and through the gifts of the community. Um, and it, it's just uh, an amazing store. Um, and really, yeah, uh, I always say it's we have everything you never know that you needed. Uh, in that store, <laughs> so you have to swing on by. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. The last time I was in, um, I had a a plate that I had bought at Pier One that I just loved, and it was a big red plate, and mine broke. And I happened right. to be at the restore, and dug on it, if you didn't have one. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and it was a big, beautiful, you know, Pier 1 plate that, uh, you know, you put on display. It's part of your big home decor. And, and there it was uh, at Habitat for Humanity. And that was after Pier 1 had closed and I couldn't buy it again. So, you know, you see fun gems. Every time I'm in there, I, I, I'm, I'm either taking or buying something. But um, always fun things to see. And for those people, um, I'll be in that boat cert- uh, shortly again. Um uh, when you're building or renovating, look at, go and check out Habitat for Humanity because not only can you get a great deal on home supplies, but think about what you're giving back to the community and how you're helping to provide those silent second mortgages. Uh, They do awesome work, and if you ever have some spare time, you can also help them build as well. 
Well, Matt, I have loved having you on the show. Thank you for all that you do for our community, you and your amazing team at Habitat for Humanity. And it's just a joy to get an update on what you're doing, and we really appreciate all of the work to to not only build new homes but to repair our older homes, keep our community looking fresh, keep our seniors in their homes. Uh, it's it's got to be a joy to go to work every day. Yeah, it's, it, it, you know... Um there's always challenges, but at the end of the day, uh, I get to smile when I know that um, soon I'm going to be handing a, a set of keys to a brand new homeowner. I mean, that just really keeps you going. Absolutely. Well, it's making me smile now. <laughs> yeah, just the thought. I absolutely love it. Well, thank you so much, and we look forward to having you on again and getting up further updates soon. Absolutely, Pam. Thank you so much. You guys have a great day. Aloha. Thank you, you too. Blessings and aloha. All right. Well, next we're going to talk to Christopher Branson, and he is with a company called Combined Insurance, um, also with the acronym CHUBB. Christopher has been with he has been in the industry of insurance for 22 years, leading teams around the nation in the voluntary benefits industry. And he's going to talk to us about what we talk, what we mean by voluntary benefits. Um, but he's also honored to be working in Hawaii with his local team of 24 people that are spread throughout the Hawaiian islands and supporting our local communities because, you know, insurance is one of those things I mean, we all have to have it for our cars and our homes, but there's also many different ways that insurance can benefit us. Uh, you, you see commercials talking about um, other pieces of insurance that are options that you can add on, but what the benefits are to doing that. But when life happens, right, and you don't expect a crisis, and, you know, we budget for our everyday um but insurance is one of those things you want to budget for because when life happens and it's unexpected, you want to make sure you're prepared. If you're sick, you're out of work, you want to make sure that you and your family are covered. And Chris is also, uh, you know, he's he's big on insurance, but he's also big on family and helping people protect their families like he protects his. He says he's married to his soulmate. And he is the father of five children. So imagine that and uh, running a running a huge team and working to help so many others. So, Chris, I understand you're on the line. Aloha and good morning. Aloha and good morning. Yeah, thank you. So for glad to have you with us. How are you doing us. this morning? I am excellent. How about you? Wonderful. Another beautiful day in paradise. Uh, you know, I'm, the sun is shining and it's just glorious. <laughs> I can I can see from Kahului to Kihei today. It's just beautiful. It is absolutely gorgeous. So tell you know we were we were just I was just talking a little bit about um, Chubb and Combined Insurance and can you tell us a little bit about what you do and one of the things that I love is you mentioned uh, voluntary benefits industry so tell us a little bit about that uh, yes I am so um, you know I've been in the voluntary business voluntary benefits business 22 years uh, good portion of that career was with Aflac and I, I was uh, helping manage the organization here uh, before COVID hit and during COVID. So, you know, of course, a lot of us, a lot of the community struggled during that time period with yeah. illnesses and, 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 of course, different things that happened. And I was getting ready to retire. And Chubb is the largest PNC insurance provider in the world. They reached out to me about mid last year and said that they had uh, acquired another company that does voluntary benefits. And they asked if I would step in and help uh, build an organization here. We're now up to uh, 14 active people with another 10 uh, coming on board. And, you know, it's what we do is so important. And I'll give you an example. Uh, it sounds like, you know, you're talking about different pieces of the insurance pie. And, you know, I've been a, I've been a policyholder for a little over 22 years. Mm -hmm. uh, people in our circle know that, that our immediate family has been impacted by cancer uh, brother is about a year into his uh, his colon cancer treatment. Uh, one of my best friends uh, got a call just a couple weeks ago that that her daughter was, you know, unfortunately diagnosed with a terminally ill, uh, you know, condition. And you know, they're just it's really about quality of life right now. But they're doing everything they can for her. 
you know, my, my family uh, is going through cancer treatment right now. And, and, you know, it's hard enough going through the physical and emotional side of it. But, you know, very few people you know, even realize, you know, the financial impact that, that's coming. And, you know, we filed our first claim two weeks ago, you know, for this recent cancer diagnosis. We just received a check for $14,700. And, you know, my, my wife and I were sitting in my office two days ago just sitting down paying leftover medical bills. Right. You know, we paid about $6,000 in bills for travel and treatment. And if I didn't have this type of coverage in place, you know, that, that would have been coming out of my bank account. So I'm very grateful for, you know, the opportunity not only to have access to these benefits, but to help protect the community. Uh, we specialize in benefits that are available to self-employed people. So people that, you know, maybe have a hard time finding benefits like these and just benefits in general. <clears throat> they can get disability. They can get coverage for accidents and injuries. They can obviously get coverage for heart attacks, strokes, cancer, those type of things. And, and we all know what health insurance is. That's meant to pay the doctor and hospital. So if we get hurt or sick, hopefully our Kaiser or HMSA is going to pay for most of that bill. But our health insurance was not designed to give us money to put food on the table, pay our rent, car payment, you know, those everyday bills that are coming in. Uh, we still have leftover medical expenses that we're going to have to pay. And then, of course, our major medical was never meant to um, replace our lost income. So these benefits pay cash directly to people. So when they get hurt or sick, regardless of what their health insurance pays or doesn't pay, they will turn around, put in a separate claim with us, and we're going to cut them a check for a couple hundred dollars or a couple thousand dollars or more. The money goes directly into their bank account. They can use the money for anything that they want. And, and our benefits are 3 to $8 a week for individuals and just a few dollars more to cover the entire family. So it's a very affordable way for our families to own something that will actually pay us, you know, when, when life happens and, and someone gets hurt or sick. That's the thing. You know, we never know. And and so many families, I mean, it's been true for many, many years. We keep hearing that savings um, for generations haven't been what they were, you know, when my grandmother was a, a big saver. And so, you know, so many families, and especially in Hawaii, where our cost of living is higher, it's hard to have a lot of reserves on hand. And when you're unexpectedly out of work and not getting paid, when you've exhausted things like TDI and and your other benefits that come with uh, your employer, then paying those bills that start stacking up, you know, is is a big challenge. And I know that Very you've true. got affordable solutions that can really help people plan. And uh, what are some of the what are some of the key services? that you offer in this insurance realm? I know you've been talking about some of them, but what are some of the typical things that both individuals and businesses um, purchase regularly that, that's one of the key pieces that they put in their portfolio? Well, you know, I think most of us have, you know, over the years we've learned that a lot of times we're getting our benefits through our employer, through our business, and for business owners, this is a solution that they can put in place that does not cost them anything. So if someone is a business owner that's listening, you know, we would love to meet with them. It's at no cost to the company to not only look at the benefits, but to actually put the benefits in place. Uh, the benefits are for the employees. They're paid for by the employees. They protect the employees. You know, when, when life is going to happen, you know, it's just, you know, we are, you know, life can happen. We are going to get hurt or sick, unfortunately. And, and so this is a great way for business owners to strengthen their benefit package at no cost protect the employees when they get hurt or sick. Uh, for businesses, if they're putting additional benefits in place, it helps attract and retain higher quality employees because it shows that we're doing more for them. And when a company puts our benefits in place, we actually pay for an additional benefit for every single employee, whether they participate in the other benefits or not. They're going to have access to telemedicine or ID theft protection or an accidental death plan. And that's something that we, that, that's our contribution you know, the, um, because they are partnering up with us. So for business owners, it's a great way to do more for their employees. And then, you know, obviously the benefits are for the employees, but if someone is an individual or they're working for a larger corporation or they're self-employed and maybe they, they haven't had access to these benefits before, they can call us and we can help them out. We're one of the only companies in Hawaii that offers disability on a direct basis that covers them from day one. So if they get, they get injured and can't work or you know, sick or illness, pregnancy, you know, something more serious, we start replacing their income from day one. 
and it pays on top of TDI. And then we have a second disability plan that actually kicks in after a certain time period that, that covers a lot more of their income. And so if someone is, is active, you know, that they should look at one of our accident plans. If the income of their household is dependent uh, on their income, you know, if, if, if the family is dependent on the income, definitely look at a disability plan. If they have a history of heart attacks or strokes or cancer is a concern, you know, we have programs that cover that. And then we also have several life insurance options that are available including uh, options that include long-term care. So those are, if, and if someone has these type of benefits in place through another company, you know, they'll typically see a 20 to 40% price reduction. And so if they're going to have the same benefits, you know, it's worth doing a cost analysis just to see if this is something, you know, where they can have the same benefits but save money. Absolutely. Well, and we, you know, again, the saving money, the, the more you can save on some of these things while maximizing your, you know, your benefits, again, that that's put towards your savings. So this is the time when we we're, we're watching things at both a, a state and and a national level, and you know, it's that time again where we're saying, hey, we might come up against some hard times coming up soon. So this is a good time to save and do some analysis that can benefit you in so many different ways. So. Uh, Christopher, tell everybody quickly how they can connect with you and, and reach out to you. Yeah, and I want to thank you for the time, Pamela. You know, just, this is, you know, what we do is education, and then we have a great local support system. So if you'd like more information, please give me a call. My number is 808-269-0651. Um, again, that number is 808-269-0651. If you prefer email, you can reach me at Christopher.Branson at Combined.com. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn uh, under Christopher Branson. A lot of good information on there as well. But I would love to help you if possible. I have a great local support team here. You know, we're committed to helping the community as much as we can and working with the Chamber more to host education meetings and, and help with, you know, risk management and just, just anything that we can help out. We, we, we love supporting the community, and, and, and we're definitely getting a lot more involved. So thank you for this opportunity. Our great pleasure. It's been wonderful to have you on. Thank you so much, and we're so excited about our partnership and the things we're going to be offering members. So uh, just really appreciate you being on today. That's all the time we have for Business Matters. I hope you'll join us next Tuesday and want to wish everyone a great, beautiful Maui day. Blessings and aloha. Bye.